Okay. Uh, hi, today we're lucky to have David uh, Goldhaber uh, Gordon from Stanford, who will be telling you about some of his most recent work. Um, David's background is the following. He is actually an original uh, Harvard, product of Harvard, back uh, at his uh, AB in 1994. Uh, and then he went to work at MIT with Mark Kastner. And while he was at MIT, uh, he did an experiment that had really a serious and uh, big important effect. That's to discover the condo effect in a single electron transistor that is a small quantum dot that just has one electron spin in it. That was really a big deal and uh, led to a number of awards uh, for him in years after that. Um, following that, he was a junior fellow at uh, Harvard uh, working with me and uh, some other people uh, and uh, continued to do really uh, nice things and then moved on to uh, Stanford uh, University initially as a professor and getting tenure and as he should and uh, I am delighted. Um, David has non won a uh, number of awards. Uh, in 2002, he got both the uh, William, William McMillan Award and then the George E. Valley Prize of the American uh, Physical uh, Society uh, for his work. After that, he got a David and Lucille uh, Packard Fellowship in 2004, a Sloan Fo Foundation Fellowship 2003, and uh, a nice long list of uh, other uh, awards in addition to that. Uh, recently, he's been working on quantum materials, in particular layers of uh, graphene, and he'll be uh, telling you about that today. So, uh, yes, thank you very much, Bob, for the uh, the gracious introduction. I'm just uh, shifting my setup one more time because um, I want to have the video working um, better. Um, so I think that that looks okay. Yeah, that's very Great. nice. Great, wonderful. Um, so thanks all for coming. Uh, as I was uh, musing to the um, organizers uh, right before we started, I'm not sure what I was thinking in setting up to uh, talk with you today, but uh, I really appreciate your um, your being here. And um, uh, to make this um, as useful as possible for you and interactive, please don't hesitate to um, ask questions and interrupt. Uh, I realize that I'm, um, um, if not bringing coals to Newcastle, I'm bringing uh, graphene to Cambridge, which is perhaps much the same thing. Um, and so I'm going to, though I'll um, give an introduction to, um, to Van der Waals stacks of materials, I'm going to try to go through that relatively quickly so that I can get to some of the new and surprising things. Uh, but uh, for that reason, please don't hesitate to uh, ping me. Also, um, if you have a question, uh, don't worry about raising your hand, just call out um, and uh, I'm happy to answer or tell you if I want to put it off. Great. So, um, so the sort of provocative question that I raised at the beginning is, can you make a magnet out of carbon? And the, the reason that I ask that is that um, to me, it's very surprising that one would get magnetism uh, not in cobalt, nickel, iron, but in a uh, material that we're normally used to thinking of as non-magnetic. And I'll explain um, how is something of a surprise that emerged uh, and how maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise. So, um, so let's start by uh, uh, introducing graphene. So graphene is uh, single atomic layers of um, carbon. Uh, nowadays, uh, so I'm old enough to remember uh, the days of uh, carbon nanotubes when they were the hottest new thing. And then a carbon nanotube was uh, described as, um, as wrapping up a single sheet of, uh, of carbon into a tube. Um, uh, now maybe uh, graphene is described, in the early days of graphene, it was described as <laughs> slicing a carbon nanotube and, un and unwrapping it. So um, it's all a matter of perspective. But uh, it's a single atomic layer of carbon uh, with a honeycomb lattice. Um, and um, the properties of graphene or stacks of layers of graphene depends on the, on the stacking. So for example, uh, um, 
you probably can't see my pointer. Is that correct? Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to try to work without that anyway. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, we have a uh, the band structure, the energy versus momentum relationship for one layer of graphene. And this was something that excited people a lot when it became possible to uh, obtain graphene experimentally, uh, that uh, energy versus momentum is a linear, um, a linear relationship um, reminiscent of massless particles instead of the standard behavior that we see of massive particles for regular electrons. So monolayer graphene has some striking behavior. And for, um, for those who are not um, so much plugged into this, I'd say it's not just the energy versus momentum is linear, but actually the uh, the analogy to massless fermions uh, is a very strong one, and it, um, the Dirac equation actually uh, describes this um, very well. So now let's imagine stacking two layers on top of each other in such a way that they're stacked exactly on top of each other. Every atom is on top of an atom in uh, the layer below, and it turns out that that's a rather uh, energetically unfavorable configuration, but if we did that, we would end up with um, with a rather different uh, dispersion that would um, split these cones out to finite momentum, uh, or sorry, to, to different momenta compared to where they were before. Um, and if on the other hand, we stack the graphene in a way that it likes to stack more and that you find in natural graphite, uh, so-called Bernal stacking, you get something, again, quite striking that um, looks more like a parabolic um, uh, energy versus momentum, but with no gap. And um, uh, so, uh, so the stacking is really important. Um, now, uh, the most interesting thing with stacking uh, lately was something that was, um, was experimentally um, pushed forward most by Pablo Herrillo Herrero's um, group, and that is twisted bilayer graphene. And, uh, so in that case, um, the stacking is not steady as you go across the sample because uh, there's a small twist between the two layers. And so there are some places where we get the AA stacking that I described, uh, in other places, AB. And um, BA is just like AB, but um, uh, with switching which atoms have atoms uh, above them. Um, so if we imagine just taking um, the even though we know that stacking makes a difference to the um, the uh, energies that electrons can have, imagine that we just took two separate monolayers and we twisted them with respect to each other. Then because the uh, interesting things in momentum space are occurring not at the at zero momentum, but rather at the edge of the Brion zone at high momentum, when we twist, the momenta that they occur at uh, are shifted. And so we could imagine having cones, energy versus momentum, uh, that are centered at different points in momentum space for the two layers. However, these, uh, these layers are not entirely independent of each other. There is tunneling between the layers. And for that reason, when these two cones cross, as we're familiar with in quantum mechanics, we, uh, we open a gap. Uh, we have an anti-crossing. Um, and if uh, the angle between the two layers is tuned so that um, that anti-crossing is brought down to, if you make the angle smaller and smaller, that, ang that anti-crossing will be brought to lower and lower energy. And eventually the, um, the shape of the cones is going to change so that it um, becomes flat uh, energy independent of momentum uh, uh, for, um, for low energies. And so that's, you know, why, why is this uh, important? Um, it's important because uh, and uh, I'm showing here calculations uh, by Tim Caxeris's group in collaboration with Pablo Herrero Herrera's group um, that built on work from uh, Alan McDonald uh, um, uh, going back nearly a decade um, and showing that if you take full account of how the system should relax, uh, then actually you should not only get a flat behavior of energy versus momentum, but actually a, a separated band uh, and then a gap to higher energy um, uh, dispersion. So what is interesting about this, this so-called flat band, it's that if everything that we're used to for electrons and materials 
is based on the idea that we fill the lowest energy states first, then higher and higher energies until we run out of electrons. But if the energy of electrons is independent of which state we fill, let's say independent of momentum, then there's no motivation to fill one state over another. And instead, electrons can fill states uh, in order to minimize their, uh, their collective interaction strength. And so uh, one way of saying this is that electron interactions are important and therefore correlations among the electrons locations uh, become important. Um, so by taking um, kinetic energy out of the problem, Coulomb energy becomes what guides how electrons fill states. Um, and uh, so this was um, studied uh, in a range of experimental studies, and then most dramatically, a couple of years ago, um, um, Yuan Chao um, uh, uh, in Pablo Jorge Rivera's group found that, um, that this system at around the predicted twist angle for a flat band showed not only interesting insulating states that you wouldn't expect without interactions, but superconductivity. And that was really exciting because you know, though superconductivity has been found in carbon in uh, many forms, it had never been seen in, um, in graphene. Um, and uh, then there's been a whole lot of work in this area since then. I'm just flagging uh, one of the, the first um, reproductions of this work and extensions of this work by uh, Matt Yankowitz, who is then uh, working in Corey Dean's group uh, at Columbia. Um, and, uh, you know, when Pablo's work came out, uh, lots of people, including um, me and my group, were excited to try to uh, replicate it and, uh, and build on it. So, um, uh, so the, I, I'm just going to say briefly how these samples are made. They're stacks of, they're not just two layers of graphene, but they're stacked between uh, layers of boron nitride, which has typically been thought of as an inert, uh, atomically flat dielectric. As we'll see, that's an oversimplified picture. And then through uh, very clever work at Columbia uh, from uh, 2013, it's possible to, even though the uh, graphene or the twisted bilayer graphene is protected by these two layers of boron nitride protected from the environment, still one can make electrical contact to it at the edge. And so here's um, an example, of, uh, an image of a completed sample. In fact, the one that I'll talk about most. Um, and the kinds of measurements that we can make um, often will be, for example, um, longitudinal resistance measurements. Um, and I just want to walk you through this picture. There's, there are two gate electrodes, one on top of the sample and one behind the sample. And we can tune the voltages on both of them. If we tune the voltages in the same direction, that cuts um, from the bottom left to the upper right of this image. Um, and the image is plotting as a color scale the longitudinal uh, resistance of this sample. So if we cut from bottom left to top right, uh, we're changing the density in the sample because we're changing both gates in the same direction. If we cut from uh, top left to bottom right, then we're changing, we're keeping the density fixed, but we're changing the electric field normal to the plane, which is called the displacement field. So this sample um, turned out, and I'll explain um, how we determine that, it turned out to have an angle of 1.20 degrees to within a hundredth of a degree. We were targeting 1.17 degrees. Um, and so it's, um, in, in many cases, it's reasonably possible to uh, hit the angle precisely. Unfortunately, it's not always possible. Uh, sometimes, uh, sorry, something happened. Uh, sometimes, um, the graphene snaps to uh, Bernal stacking uh, and uh, because that's energetically more favorable. And uh, so um, that can make the, um, the system less interesting. All right, so in this case, um, we're looking at as a function of density, for example, we can see that there's a high resistance at um, uh, a density that I'll call the charge neutrality point. It's where we're notionally um, naturally um, uh, half filling this flat band uh, that we uh, have at low energy or in graphene, we would just fill the lower Dirac cone and not the upper one. And then uh, we have some features and then we have another very high resistance. That's where we've completely filled the flat band. Um, and 
Uh, you can see halfway there, there's another relatively high resistance that's half filling of the flat band and something that uh, Pablo's group discovered is an insulator, even though you wouldn't initially think that it would be an insulator. So uh, I mentioned that boron nitride is, uh, uh, has been thought of as a pretty inert dielectric. It turns out it's not quite as inert as that. Um, it matters how the graphene uh, interacts with the boron nitride. Um, and so uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the impact of aligning the graphene with the boron nitride. So uh, in the sample that I'm going to be talking most about, the, um, I told you what the graphene twist was. It turns out that we can also determine the twist to one boron nitride layer. Um, and that's about uh, a little under a degree uh, to the nearby graphene. And so they're, they're nearly aligned with each other. And that was accidental. We didn't set out to do that. Um, uh, uh, we've since then made other samples that are not aligned. And so here's an example of one where the twist of the boron nitride is, is large, but the twist of the two graphene layers is somewhat comparable, um, a little closer to magic angle. And I want to show you uh, data like what I showed you uh, on the previous slide, but for these two samples. So uh, first for the one that's not aligned to the boron nitride, um, I've now transformed into the uh, dimensions of displacement fields. So the field normal to the plane on the vertical axis and the um, the density on the horizontal axis. So this is just a linear transformation of the plots uh, as a function of the two gate voltages. And again, there's a color scale for longitudinal resistance. Um, and now we look at this for the aligned case. And if you look at these two, they look kind of similar. Um, you see a high resistance at the zero density. Um, here, by the way, the horizontal axis for density, I'm plotting in two different units. At the bottom, I plot in units of the full filling of the band. So one is completely filling the band, minus one is completely emptying the, the valence part of the band. Um, uh, and then on the top, I show the, uh, the density in electrons per uh, centimeter squared. Um, and so these, the bright features, uh, the, the, high resist the highest resistances occur when we completely fill the band. Um, and uh, so if we look at the two, you can see because of the twist angle, we fill the band at a different density in the two cases. Um, but otherwise, these look pretty similar. They have high resistance at zero density, high resistance at full filling and at full emptying of the, uh, the band. And um, uh, a feature relatively high resistance at half filling but then you look more closely and you see there are differences. So for example, as a function of displacement field, if you look at half filling um, on the left-hand side, uh, things change with displacement field somewhat. So there's a difference between negative displacement field and positive displacement field. Positive displacement field enhances the resistance of this state. So there's something that's different, um, something that breaks the, the vertical inversion symmetry in this case uh, and that's not true in, with the large boron nitride twist angle. Another difference is um, if you just look at the color scales, uh, I've used different color scales for the two cases. Uh, on the right side, the, um, the resistances are uh, topping out at a bit over 10 kilo ohms. In the, uh, on the left side, tops out at about a mega ohm. Um, so those are different and I'll, I'll comment on how that matters. So now let's... Uh, I feel like um, color plots, color maps uh, can really make things jump out, but um, I also feel that they can uh, hide a multitude of sins. It's, you know, you can choose a color scale and make it um, make th certain things uh, pop out. So I think it's useful to do line cuts through here. So let's do a line cut at a constant displacement field uh, for, for each of these two plots. And first, we'll look at the case for the misaligned boron nitride. And I apologize for the coarseness of this. Um, uh, I didn't, we didn't take the data in order to facilitate this kind of cut. But what you can see is that there's a peak in resistance at, um, zero, uh, at zero density at the charge neutrality point, and then these other peaks. And at the charge neutrality point, if you look at the resistance that we find, 
it's about two kilo ohms, uh, the resistivity specifically, resistance per square. So two kilo ohms is actually a pretty typical resistivity for, uh, for graphene, high quality graphene. Um, and you might expect that in graphene, uh, in ordinary graphene, the resistivity would go on uh, to infinity. There would be no conductance when you go to the charge neutrality point because um, there's no Fermi surface, there are no carriers there. But it turns out that, um, uh, that because of symmetries of the system, as you approach zero density, uh, actually the mean free path should diverge and you should never get an insulating behavior. You should always get uh, a metal. Uh, and that means that the con conductivity should always be on the order of E squared over H or higher. Uh, more specifically, uh, the, the minimum conductivity should be four E squared over pi H, which happens to correspond to about uh, 20 kilo ohms. Um, and so two kilo ohms is a nice comfortable uh, value there when we're dealing with graphene. In contrast, on the left side, the resistivity at the charge neutrality point is over 100 kilo ohms. And that says something's different, something on, on is not like you'd expect for ordinary uh, graphene. It's too high, it's become an insulator. Um, and you can also see other features in this plot that when you go out to densities that are a little beyond one, a little beyond full filling, you see additional features, uh, a shoulder on the right side, a peak on the left side, and these features turn out to be associated with the moiré pattern, the um, periodic pattern that is formed by the graphene together with the boron nitride. Uh, and again, we didn't intend that the graphene and boron nitride were almost aligned, but they ended up being, uh, and we were able to look back at images that we had uh, taken during the making of the sample and see that the facets of the boron nitride were nearly aligned with the facets of the graphene um, and uh, when we you know, look at this carefully on the computer, our best estimate would have been a one degree misalignment uh, between the two. It turns out to be about 0.8 degrees based on the transport measurements, uh, based on what, um, um, based on uh, what density we needed to go to to see these features. So, um, uh, so this is not the first time that it's been known that um, boron nitride and graphene can interact in important ways. So um, in 2013, work by both my group and Pablo Jurio Herrera's group showed that you could get insulating behavior in graphene on boron nitride. And Pablo's group in particular pointed out that this was sensitive to the twist angle between the two. Um, I, my group did not find um, a clear twist angle dependence, but uh, it's possible that that's because we got a lot of graphene that was actually snapping in and aligning with boron nitride. And you can see here that uh, we got um, resistances at low temperature, at two Kelvin up to 400 kilo ohms. Actually, it even goes up to, uh, to mega ohms um, uh, at, at lower temperature. So we can open by putting graphene aligned with boron nitride, we can open up a gap at charge neutrality in monolayer graphene. And the, the idea is that you, know, you, um, um, you um, break the sublattice symmetry of the system that was guaranteeing you that these two cones meet and, um, and then you can open up a gap. All right, so, um, so boron nitride seems to be opening a gap in the system. And just to give you some visualization of this, uh, here's a cartoon of the graphene. Um, here's putting on a second graphene layer in a different color. And you can see that because there's a twist angle, the two go in and out of registry with each other with a period that's on the order of 10 nanometers that forms the what's called the moiré pattern. Um, and uh, now when, and, uh, and that forms effectively the unit cell of the, um, of the new bands that form in the system, uh, even though this is not actually a periodic um, unit cell. Um, and now we uh, put boron nitride overlaid on top of this uh, with the actual angles that we're using and Interestingly, the boron nitride is, um, forms a moiré that's basically the same spacing and uh, the same orientation as the graphene-graphene moiré, which didn't need to happen at all. Um, it is still unclear whether that is important in the physics that we see. Uh, uh, I would say the simplest picture is just that the boron nitride aligned with graphene 
uh, opens up gaps and you don't need to worry about any of the other details, but it's, I think that's, it's curious and we'll come back to it later, uh, the, the question of how the details matter. So now let's go into measuring the sample. And one of the first things that we do when we're measuring it is to try to determine what is the carrier density uh, at a given gate voltage. And so um, to do that, one thing we can do is to uh, measure the Hall slope, uh, measure the, the Hall effect in the sample as a function of magnetic field. And here's the Hall signal on the vertical axis as a function of a, a rather narrow range of magnetic fields, just over a tenth of a Tesla in either direction. And you can see that there is a slope of the Hall signal with magnetic field. And this is, it turns out, a, a density that is an eighth filling of the conduction band in the system, um, the conduction flat band in the system. Um, an eighth filling is represented by 0.12, um, but it's also useful to know that this conduction band can, can hold four electrons with two spins and two, um, um, two orbital indices. And so um, an eighth filling means that there's a half electron per more ASA. All right, so now um, we, can, um, we can look at, um, at uh, half filling or two electrons per more A cell. Uh, and here there's uh, a flatter behavior of the, um, the Hall signal, perhaps related to the insulator there. Uh, we can go to five eighths filling or uh, two and a half electrons per more A cell. And then we come to three electrons per more A cell and it looks a bit different. So, here, um, so there are some striking things, and I'm just showing you the first data that we took uh, on this sample. Um, you can see that there's a much steeper Hall slope here, uh, and it gets out, uh, it's not linear, it, uh, it saturates, and it saturates at quite low field, uh, and the value that it saturates at is, is very large. It's a couple of kilo ohms, so it's getting up towards the 26 kilo ohms that is the, um, a special value, the, um, the, um, uh, the quantum of resistance uh, that one gets uh, in quantum Hall effect. So this, this was really striking to us. Um, and so my student, Aaron Sharp, uh, noticed this, uh, you know, to his credit, he was a little bit down because he wasn't seeing superconductivity, but he noticed that there was something anomalous here. Uh, and he um, suggested, let's cool this down in a dill fridge. Um, because this measurement was just at one and a half Kelvin. And when he did, uh, he saw that he got even larger uh, anomalous Hall signals. Here's an example of it. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by anomalous Hall. But you can see that the Hall effect is relatively flat and then has a big jump pretty near to zero magnetic field um, and then uh, some other features. And um, strikingly now, uh, which we didn't see in the first measurement, um, when we sweep the magnetic field back, there's a memory of what it's been exposed to in terms of magnetic field. And um, so we get a hysteresis loop in this Hall signal. And that suggests that the system is in some way ferromagnetic, um, which we certainly didn't expect. Um, and I just want to, uh, to uh, emphasize, or I, I want to point out that so this was at around three quarters filling, that is three electrons per more A cell. Um, and this measurement is at two Kelvin. So it turned out it wasn't important uh, that, it, that this was uh, done in, at millikelvin temperatures. What was important between the dill fridge and the other cryostat was filtering the electrical lines so that we didn't have a lot of noise coming from cell phones and other signals at room temperature. Um, all right, so it seems like we have some magnet and carbon. Uh, so answering part of the question um, uh, that I originally posed, but, um, but it's, not, it's not clear what it is. Uh, so, um, uh, so let's first characterize the sample a little bit more. So, um, so first of all, uh, we can look at the longitudinal and the Hall resistance on the left side and the longitudinal resistance you can see, it does change a bit uh, across this uh, hysteresis loop, but not very much. It's centered at around 10 kilo ohms, um, whereas the Hall resistance has l very large changes from around uh, 6 to minus 6 kilo ohms. Um, and if we now look at the size of this uh, jump in the Hall signal near zero field, uh, on the right-hand side in red, 
I've plotted the strength of that jump and you can see that it's peaked very near three quarters filling or three electrons per more A cell. Um, and it exists away from there. And in fact, there's a long tail. There's some, some jump even at fillings uh, that are um, uh, getting up uh, toward full filling of the band, but, um, but it's strongest at three electrons per more A cell. We can also look at the slope of the Hall signal as we're approaching zero field. And that's what I've uh, shown in blue on the right side. And you can see that um, going from the high, high density side, that Hall slope is getting, is negative and it's getting bigger and bigger as we approach three quarters filling. And on the left side, you can't see that well, but it's, uh, it's positive and it, sorry, it's positive and, you can, and it's starting to get bigger as you approach three quarters filling. And then between the two, it um, goes through zero. And this is what we would expect if we had um, an insulating state or a semi-metal, um, something that had on, at lower densities had electrons and at higher densities, we started to get holes and uh, there was a gap or a, a very tiny Fermi surface in the middle. And the fact that the two joined together instead of diverging to infinity uh, at three quarters filling is presumably because there are um, some electrons and some holes, either puddles from disorder or uh, for some other reason. So, um, all right, so it seems like we have probably uh, a gap or at least some structure in the Fermi surface forming at three quarters filling. Um, and right at that point, we get a strong anomalous Hall signal, a strong um, uh, Hall signal that's not just reflecting the density of carriers, but reflecting magnetism. The fine structure of, uh, of these hysteresis loops is actually very repeatable. So here's an example. So if you look at the Hall resistance and you go around about 10 times, you can see that there, not only is the overall shape similar, but there are jumps at particular fields uh, that occur consistently every time. Uh, and this suggests that the magnet that we're probing has a domain structure and the domains uh, are pinned in some way and they switch at, uh, at different fields, uh, but consistently every time, as long as we don't warm up the sample. Um, uh, again, this domain structure is reflected in the longitudinal resistance, but it's a smaller effect. It's some kind of mixing in of something that's fundamentally a, a Hall behavior. Just going through a little more of the phenomenology, the magnetism is stable if we don't apply a field. So here we have uh, a Hall resistance and we wait for six hours as much as we had the patience for, and it basically doesn't change. And if we um, had uh, a hysteresis loop that we do on the right side, and then we wait for six hours at zero field, and then we continue the hysteresis loop. It's as if uh, no time had passed. We just continue uh, tracing out that same loop. So this, uh, this magnet is somewhat robust, um, albeit at low temperature, but you've seen already that it doesn't need to be millikelvin temperatures. Uh, so uh, let's look at the robustness with temperature. On the left side, you can see the hysteresis loops starting at the bottom at uh, tens of millikelvin and going up through five Kelvin when the hysteresis has entirely disappeared. And what you can see is that the, um, the size of the loop and field, the coercivity is uh, getting steadily smaller as we raise the temperature. And on the right side, I plot that in blue. You can see the coercive field is going down with temperature and basically gone at four Kelvin. But, um, but the size of the jump near zero field um, actually stays pretty steady out to three and a half Kelvin or so, um, even as we lose the coercivity. Uh, and in fact, it even gets a little bit bigger with raising temperature, which may be reflecting that it's easier to, um, to polarize domains. Um, so, um, so as we look at this phenomenology, we see a large anomalous Hall signal, that is a large signal that's not simply proportional to uh, one over carrier density, an apparent insulating state, not a, uh, not a strongly insulating state, but a state that has um, uh, conductivity that um, gets lower with lower temperature, uh, evidence of domain structure. And all of this is reminiscent of early magnetic topological insulators, um, uh, which were being probed in the early 2010s um, by Tokura's group, for example, Joe Chikelsky. Um, and uh, so these data look very similar to those and suggested to us that maybe what we were looking at 
was a churn insulator that is an analog of a quantum Hall system, but at zero magnetic field. Um, and ideally, this would involve zero longitudinal resistivity and quantized Hall resistivity. And um, we didn't see that, but um, um, we did see something that was on the order of the quantum of resistance, uh, getting up close to a half of it. And um, longitudinal resistance was, was not zero. It was, again, it was also on the order of the quantum of resistance. Um, and so I'm not going to, if people are interested afterwards, I can go through more of the analysis there. But, um, uh, but this suggested that we should look for evidence that um, the current that's being carried is carried in edge states that are formed um, as, as occurs in certain cases in quantum Hall effect. Um, and so, uh, so I want to first of all just um, step through why we might expect this kind of state to, to form even though we were, we were not in fact expecting it when we uh, did these measurements. So, um, so we have a band. I'm showing here notionally the, um, the part above the charge neutrality point. So uh, this is the conduction band. Um, and it's fourfold degenerate. And so if we filled two electrons per more A cell, we would be halfway up here, three electrons per more A cell, three quarters of the way up. Uh, and we should just get a metal. Um, there should be just a classic band metal. Um, already, we knew that in, um, in twisted bilayer graphene, we can get other behaviors um, uh, because of Pablo's work uh, at half filling. Um, but what might be happening here? Well, if, uh, if interactions cause electrons to want to polarize their spin and or their, um, their valley index, um, then um, then we could break up this band into four bands. Um, they were, there are four bands that are degenerate with each other or very close to degenerate, but it might be favorable to fill uh, one band completely before starting on the next. And so in this case, um, the scenario would be that we'd completely fill three of these four spin and valley polarized bands and leave the fourth one empty. So we'd have one hole per unit cell in this um, system. And because the valley is associated with, um, with a churn number, with um, something that uh, should have an edge state um, uh, with a chirality, um, we would expect to, um, in, this, in this simple scenario, we'd expect to see um, a churn insulator at this point. And there's, there is work um, largely um, uh, inspired by our experimental results, um, but showing that um, that um, aligning twisted boron nitride, uh, sorry, twisted bilayer graphene with boron nitride uh, should open up a gap and could favor these kinds of behaviors. Uh, there's also work that suggests that even without the boron nitride alignment, you could get a spontaneous gap. So this picture suggests that we should have edge transport. And so if we're serious about that, uh, we should try to, um, to look for that edge transport. And so um, something traditional to do in quantum Hall systems is to take a Hall bar and not just drive a current down the center and measure the traditional geometries for longitudinal and Hall measurements, but instead drive currents in different places and make different voltage measurements. And there are two, two particular canonical measurements uh, for so-called non-local transport. So first let's look at a three terminal configuration. Here we drive um, current from contact four to contact five. Uh, and so, you know, if you didn't have edge states, if everything were just diffusive transport, then all the current should be flowing in the region near four and five and should exponentially fall off as you go away from there. Um, uh, and uh, so, sorry, if you, if you measure voltage drop between the two ends of the hall bars, that is a, a far away place and one of the two contacts in common, then in the configuration that I was showing um, where the magnetic field is out of the plane and the edge states are traveling clockwise, uh, you would expect that the current would go um, uh, from, the, uh, from the high end, uh, the high, high potential of the current drive uh, all the way around clockwise reaching contact one 
Uh, and so there would be a potential drop between contact one and contact four. However, if you um, switch the magnetic field, then the current would go counterclockwise and would flow directly from five to four and wouldn't visit one. And so there should be no voltage drop. So in total, you'd expect to have a change in voltage, um, uh, in a change in the voltage um, between one and four of uh, corresponding to a resistance of H over E squared uh, when you um, switch the direction of magnetic field. And indeed, if we make a measurement, we see a hysteresis loop and the change in resistance is, um, uh, you know, it's about six kilo ohms, which is not 26 kilo ohms, but it's uh, on that order. Um, and that occurs at three quarters filling, uh, three electrons per more A cell, and it falls off very rapidly when you go away from that, even just a few percent away from there. So, um, so that's this three terminal measurement. Uh, you can also look at a four terminal measurement shown in the bottom left. And here um, you drive current the same way that I described before, but now you make a voltage measurement where both of the voltage contacts are far away from the current contacts. And if the uh, current were purely diffusive, there would be an exponentially small voltage drop at um, between one and two. Um, but if the current is flowing through edge states, um, either contact five or contact four would populate both of the two voltage probes. So if the current's flowing through edge states, you'd expect to see purely through edge states, you'd expect to see zero voltage drop between one and two. If the current uh, were purely um, diffusive, you'd expect to see um, a, an exponentially small, a few ohms voltage drop. And what we actually see is um, when we switch the magnetic field direction, we see uh, a jump of a couple of hundred ohms. And it turns out we can understand this as something where the current is largely flowing through edge states, but then there's some diffusive um, transport. So you can get to near contact one and then diffusively um, uh, bridge between the two edges. And that can account for this kind of drop. And there's no way to, to account for this drop purely with diffusive transport. So it seems like we have some evidence of edge transport. Um, and so uh, by analogy to the, uh, to the um, to the magnetic topological insulators, the calcogenide-based ones, um, uh, where uh, just a year after um, uh, Takora's group showed data kind of like what I showed, uh, uh, the uh, group of Chikun Shui in Tsinghua showed uh, that, uh, that there was indeed a churn insulator with quantized um, uh, resistance. I, uh, my group and I speculated that we would, um, we would indeed see a churn insulator and a quantized behavior. And, um, um, and Andrea Young's group um, looked back at one of their samples and found that it had um, twisted bilayer graphene aligned with HVN. And they made measurements on that. And they showed that indeed at low temperatures uh, in their sample, the longitudinal uh, resistance is quantized at H over E squared to within a percent or so. Uh, and actually uh, that's stable out to about four Kelvin and there's still magnetism as reflected in the Hall signal out to, um, to nearly 10 Kelvin. So, um, um, and I guess I don't, um, uh, also uh, at low temperatures, their longitudinal resistance as, as expected for a whole ins um, for a churn insulator is near zero. So, uh, so that's quite exciting. The picture's falling into place. that This is um, a churn insulator, an analog to a quantum Hall system, but it's zero magnetic field. Uh, there are some other striking things about these systems. Um, so we discovered accidentally that if we drove a DC current in the plane, uh, that we could switch the magnet. We didn't need to sweep magnetic fields. We could uh, switch the magnet reproducibly and reversibly with uh, by driving a DC current. And on the left side, I'm showing our results from hysteresis loops. You can see at tens of nanoamps, um, we switch to the other state and then we, we switch back at tens of nanoamps in the other direction. And it's, it's quite non-obvious why this should happen because if you think about it, the current is going in plane and we're switching a magnetization that I haven't talked about very much, but this magnetization uh, is almost certainly an orbital magnetization uh, 
as, as you'll see uh, soon. Um, and that's something that really wants to be out of the plane. Um, and so we're using an in-plane current to switch an out-of-the-plane magnetization. And it's not clear what determines whether driving a current toward you should cause magnetization up or driving a current toward me should cause magnetization up. So some symmetry in the system is broken. And uh, I, I've helped work on some uh, theory on this and um, uh, together with, um, with Vic Law at um, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And Andrea has uh, worked on, on theory on this uh, together with um, um, uh, Leon uh, Balance. And um, the jury is still out what is right, whether this is being switched by, uh, by something related to the edge or the bulk. Uh, but, um, but Andrea has been able to reproduce that this is, uh, the magnetization can be stably switched uh, by an in-plane um, current. So we'd like to know more about what is the magnet. I, I gave you a very uh, simple picture of what might, be the, what might be happening in the physics here, but we'd like to probe that more. And so to do that, um, we used a, um, a two-axis rotator that I designed in collaboration with, um, um, with Attocube um, so that we can point the sample in any direction relative to an external magnetic field. Uh, we can rotate both the, um, the tilt of the sample plane with respect to the magnetic field and also the, um, also the in-plane angle um, and then see what the effect of that is. And so um, why this is important is because, you know, maybe the scenario of the magnetism is not as simple as what I showed. Um, so um, Senthil suggested that maybe this could be um, Dali polarized, but not spin polarized, that we have two, um, two instead of um, having one spin in one valley completely empty, maybe we have um, uh, both spins of one valley half filled, uh, and that could be analogous to uh, the filling factor one half states for a quantum Hall system um, on the composite Fermi liquid, and that should give a large Hall signal. Um, and I, I should also say at this point that, um, you know, I, I said that the most surprising thing is that there's a magnet in carbon, but actually on reflection, the most surprising thing is that uh, the magnet that occurs is not a magnet that's based primarily on spin, it's based on, on orbital states that um, where the current circulates either counterclockwise or clockwise. And so, you know, when, when we all took electricity and magnetism, probably what we learned at the beginning was, well, magnetism comes from tiny circulating currents. And so um, you have a tiny little current loop, it produces a magnetic field. And then at some point, well, actually we lied a little bit. It's not a circulating current, it's a spin, but it behaves very much like it. This is, to my knowledge, the first experimentally demonstrated um, magnet where the magnetism is primarily orbital um, at zero magnetic field or near zero magnetic field. And so that's, um, that's pretty uh, cool, I think, um, that you have these little uh, circulating current loops uh, that are giving the magnetism. Uh, and that's why you see um, a Hall effect. If you just polarize the spin, you also need spin orbit coupling to see a Hall effect. And in carbon, spin orbit coupling is extremely weak. So, um, so you actually need that orbital magnetism to, uh, to see a Hall effect. Uh, another possibility of how you could get um, a um, churn insulator or a uh, strong Hall signal um, is if um, there's not or orbital polarization, but instead the spin orders in a way that it going around um, uh, one triangle, uh, the spin points in three different directions whose triple product um, aligns with uh, the, the up or down vertical direction. And so this is sort of emergent orbital order out of the spins. Uh, and that's uh, something that had been suggested in other kinds of materials. Uh, so, um, so uh, in looking at this, we'd like to see what's the effect of out-of-plane field, which should couple primarily, which should couple both to spin and orbital degrees of freedom, and in-plane field, field in the plane of the sample, which should couple primarily to spin, although that's an oversimplification. It can also couple to the valley. So when we look at 
hysteresis loops of the Hall signal when we have um, various tilt angles, uh, you can see it looks like a bit of a mess. But if we plot just uh, the uh, Hall resistance as a function of the perpendicular component of the field, you can see that the low field part of these loops all collapse. The only thing that's important for switching is the out of plane field, at least out to uh, being when the field is five degrees out of the plane. So the, the in plane field is 10 times as large as the out of plane field. So that tells us that there's something highly anisotropic about this magnetism. It likes to point up or down and not in the plane. And that, uh, that matches with an orbital picture. Uh, so it's mostly sensitive to the perpendicular component. We can also look at fields um, closer to in plane, so five degrees out, um, two degrees out, one degree out uh, in plane. And now there are more complicated pictures as we go really close to in plane field. The in plane field is definitely having an effect. And just to give you one flavor of that, um, here's a case where we magnetized the system with uh, an out of plane field and started then had swept the field back to zero, rotated the sample so that the field was in plane and then started sweeping magnetic field. And you can see that there's a transition into some new state. And when we come back uh, to near zero field, we don't regain as large um, magnetization. Uh, so um, something is happening at around five or six Tesla. There's some state that um, is associated with strong in-plane field and we don't yet know what it is. Um, but then when we do come back to lower field, it does uh, um, attain, it does recover some out of plane magnetization and has some non-reproducible uh, jumps uh, associated with domains. And then when we get to the same field on the opposite side, again, we go into some high in-plane field state. So there are still some interesting mysteries there. Just to give you a flavor for what's happening in this sort of area of magnetism in carbon, um, uh, at just shortly after this, um, my group was working with the group of Feng Wang at Berkeley um, on a different stack of graphene called ABC trilayer. Um, it's uh, three layers that are stacked. It's not so common in graphite, but it does occur in graphite. And it turns out that it's important whether the third layer in the stack is sitting right on top of the first layer or, in, uh, or offset from it. ABA would be where it's sitting on top and it's slightly more energetically favorable. ABC is offset. Um, and so if we um, look at this ABC um, system, it's very rich. Uh, it can be switched between different behaviors um, in a much more dramatic way than the twisted bilayer if we switch the displacement field. Um, and so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just want to say that for one direction of displacement field, we get superconductivity. That's unlike the twisted bilayer aligned with boron nitride where there's no superconductivity. Um, uh, for the other direction of displacement field, we don't see superconductivity, but we do see magnetism uh, and, um, and we do see these uh, hysteresis loops um, and so I think this is really, it's exciting that there are different, um, different tunable systems. And I think this is the ABC trilayer is particularly cool because uh, it uh, can show both superconductivity and magnetism. And so maybe those could be juxtaposed uh, by appropriate gating uh, in the system. So in the last um, part of my talk, I just want to briefly um, give a perspective. Uh, so. Uh, so scotch tape, um, remarkably, very nicely, perhaps embarrassingly, is still the king for producing high quality samples. Uh, so, uh, so when you look at, um, you exfoliate graphene from graphite, from natural graphite or, uh, or a man-made graphite sample, and then pick it up with a stamp and stack a, rain, a set of layers um, and, uh, and uh, assemble using an apparatus like what I'm showing here, um, uh, that produces the highest quality samples still. Um, uh, and so that's, uh, I, I do want to give a shout out to Pablo and, um, and Yuan and the uh, leaders of this field in general, that there's been a lot of generosity about showing how people do things. And so, um, so after, um, uh, the exciting announcement of the uh, results from Pablo's group. Um, 
uh, I asked whether um, my student Aaron could visit them and learn how they did it because we were doing stacking but not very fine rotational alignment. And they said, sure, come. Uh, and a blizzard was coming. So Aaron um, uh, looked at the flights available and booked a flight and within one hour was in the, uh, in the airport and soon thereafter on a flight. Uh, and um, uh, everyone in Pablo's group was very gracious in showing Aaron around even in the blizzard that did come. Uh, so, um, so you can do great things with this kind of setup, but the problem is that every sample is different. There are many tuning knobs uh, that we know about the different twist angles. Everything's very sensitive, even down to a hundredth of a degree twist in some cases. We can't achieve exactly what we want um, in the sample. And there's strain that's important, including the twist that can vary across the sample. So, um, so this has led to, uh, and though, you know, say the superconductivity has now been robustly reproduced many times in Pablo's group and others, it's hard to get exactly the same um, situation in two samples. Um, and so, one promising approach toward this is to replace grad students with robots. Um, just for the assembly, not for the other purposes yet. Um, and so there's a project that uh, involves Amir, Pablo, and Philip um, uh, called QPress. Um, it's a collaboration with Brookhaven, and this is being installed at Brookhaven. Um, and this involves trying to automate the different uh, steps in making samples. And I think that's going to be really impactful over the next five to 10 years for making large numbers of similar samples. But um, um, I think I, I'd like to pursue another direction, which is based on not exfoliated materials from bulk crystals, but rather um, large area grown monolayers. Uh, it turns out that CVD graphene quietly has already become um, as good as far as we can tell as exfoliated materials. It's just that you need to stack it with other stuff. Boron nitride is less, less clear that it's there, but um, uh, but the monolayers are getting quite good. Um, and so the existing state of the art involves um, um, using stamps to uh, exfoliating on uh, flakes, stamps to pick them up, stacking them. And if you try to put tens of layers together, um, this, this one is, I think, 28 layers that took uh, 20 hours with a uh, robotic system built in Japan. Um, but you can see it's a mess. It's going to be hard to to do anything with it in terms of electronics um, because there's so many other flakes around and everyone is uh, is um, irregular in shape. And so what I'm, I'm setting out to do with a collaborator, Andy Mannix, a new assistant professor at Stanford in material science, is to try to do growth of a selected set of materials, including graphene and boron nitride, and then um, patterning and assembly all in ultra high vacuum. Um, and so that should, if this dream comes to fruition, allow us uh, to start out with uh, just around one uh, film on a wafer scale and make 10,000 many layer stacks out of it. Um, and uh, there are many challenges, uh, uh, but I'm really excited to, uh, to launch on this. And we're, we have an instrumentation proposal, development proposal from NSF that's been funded and also for a different part of it for the patterning from uh, DOE at Slack. Uh, so I'm uh, excited to try to bring this to the point where we can do science. So just to summarize, um, I think we've seen today that twisted bilayer graphene is a churn insulator near, near three quarter filling uh, if it's aligned to boron nitride. Um, probably the boron nitride's role is opening up a topologically non-trivial gap, but uh, that's still, the jury is still out. Uh, it's an orbital ferromagnet it's very anisotropic uh, and there are little circulating currents. And if we put a very large in-plane field, we can kill the magnetization, at least, at least the, the orbital magnetization that was giving the Hall signal. Um, but we don't know whether that's because of coupling to Spinner Valley. And I'm excited to uh, hear ideas and explore with people. And so I just want to acknowledge uh, Aaron Sharp, who led this work with close involvement from Eli Fox, another outstanding senior student. Uh, and in the comparisons to magnetic TIs, which I've, I talked about, we've done a lot there on quantization as well. Um, we have close collaborations with um, folks at UCLA. 
And uh, for the boron nitride, we, along with everyone in the field, has been getting material from Watanabe and Taniguchi. So um, finally, uh, so I, I saw that Bert raised his hand. I just want to say one more thing, which is that um, my inspiration for getting into this field of uh, topological systems was from my late colleague, Shocheng Zhang, and I've realized increasingly over time um, how much of an impact he's made there. So um, let me now stop, and I'd be delighted to take questions, uh, and I think maybe Bert is first. Hi, questions, uh, uh, Bert Halpern. I think you have to be un unmute. Yeah, I think um, if you can add them to the chat window, that's easiest. Um, it's hidden right now. Oh, okay. I guess if you'd like to make a, a question, please type it into the chat window. So I'll, so I'll try to. Um, um, so, um, all right. So I'm going to answer. Under goal, um, asked. Is the CVD mobility comparable to the exfoliated one at four Kelvin? How about encapsulated CVD? So um, the, uh, the, to my mind, most impressive work in this area has been done by Christoph Stamper's group uh, in Germany. Um, they've taken um, uh, large area single crystals of graphene grown on copper. Um, they've taken uh, exfoliated flakes of boron nitride that are you know, typical tens of nanometers thick, picked up the graphene off of the copper uh, and then encapsulated with a second boron nitride layer. And in those cases, they've gotten ballistic transport over a 30 micron sample, so bigger than anyone was really able to uh, study or published on um, uh, in fully exfoliated flakes. So I would say, you know, the jury may still be out in terms of which is higher quality, but uh, it seems like the graphene is, is now not limiting the quality. Uh, other questions? Uh, I had a, a question uh, myself. You say that the origin of the edge states and the fact that it's magnetic so that you're circulating only in one direction preferentially is coming orbital, but I guess the question is how does that related to the spin orbit effect, which is weak and uh, carbon graphene and uh, or um, the uh, you know magnetic uh, ions are the kind of things sure. that people add to make that happen. Right. So yeah. So Bob, that's a, a really important and interesting question. Um, you asked. Um, all right. If the orbital um, systems are or ordered, um, what's happening to the spin? You know, what is their spin orbit coupling? So right. my my starting point there is. Um, though, the, though there's been some spin orbit coupling detected, say, in carbon nanotubes that's probably related to the, um, the, um, the curvature there, um, my expectation is that spin orbit coupling is very weak in, uh, in graphene. And therefore, if indeed we're seeing um, orbital order and spin order, it may be that the spin uh, is ferromagnetic, it's polarized, but in a direction that has nothing to do with the orbital order. And the spin, uh, the spin order may be rather floppy um, and floppy spatially, and it may be able to pivot to different directions. So uh, I think we don't yet know. And I hope that these tilted field measurements and other probes may help tell us what's happening with the spin order, but it's, um, um, but it's, not, it's not clear. Uh, so um, I, so I, I have a question from Rick Heller um, who asked, uh, do you have any new insight into the mechanism of superconductivity of twisted bilayer graphene from this work? Um, so I would say uh, not directly. Of course, we don't see superconductivity um, that suggests that maybe when we rearrange the polarization of the bands, that's important. And so maybe, maybe uh, topology could be a problem for superconductivity. I know it's also been suggested that topology in these systems can also be important for superconductivity. So I would probably, um, I, I can say in, uh, in ABC trilayer, um, I think we can get more insight because in, in a single sample, we can change the displacement field, change the, uh, the, uh, the topological order of the bands and um, see that 
uh, superconductivity and magnetism uh, don't occur in the same conditions. And so maybe we can talk about that more, but I think implicit bilayer graphene, I think I'd probably rely more on the, the studies where people have actually looked at it, uh, looked at the superconductivity and um, uh, what happens when you have more screening, for example, do you enhance or suppress the superconductivity? Um, so um, so uh, if, if I didn't answer your question, you can type something more, Rick. Um, Bert, um, uh, Bert Halperin said, uh, it looked like the quantized RXY was only around one sixth of H over E squared. Is that correct and why? Um, so let me uh, go back to, um, all right, I need to um, uh, go away from the chat uh, and, um, right. So I'm going to start um, by looking at the largest anomalous Hall signal that we, um, that we saw in our sample. And that one, first of all, you can see that it's not symmetric. Um, uh, the, it hits, you know, minus 12 kilo ohms, but only plus um, seven kilo ohms, or minus 13 kilo ohms, but only plus seven. Uh, the, if you average those two and say this is mixing with longitudinal, then it's basically plus minus 10 kilo ohms. So it's approaching, but not quite at um, one half h over e squared. Um, and why is it not getting there? Um, I think it's because there is some bulk conduction in the sample, uh, whether that's because of domain structure or because the gap is not a hard gap. Um, but I think that generally, if, uh, if you have uh, sigma xx is not zero, then, um, uh, then you will not find uh, rho xy necessarily quantized. Uh, so that's my take on it. But, uh, but if you look at uh, Andrea Young's um, measurements on their on their RXY is actually um, very close to H over E squared and they have to play some tricks because they don't have an ideal geometry but I would say that um, that it's not you know not a quarter or six that's really H on E squared and you can't see from this measurement but it's really to around a percent uh, quantization. Okay, well, there's one last uh, question from, oh, this one's not easy to answer, I think, but from uh, Yuval Ronan to the panelist, does seeing uh, superconductivity and anomalous call the whole effect in the same sample by gating help the effort of merging them in order to separately separate Majorana edges? Yes, so, um, yeah, so it's a, a great question and a natural one, Yuval, and I think that, of course, it would be a dream to have in a single material both magnetism and, um, and well, both quantum Hall-like behavior and superconductivity, which have been really nicely um, juxtaposed using different materials um, by, uh, among others, uh, Philip Kim's group and, uh, and Amiria Kobe's group here uh, at Harvard. Um, it would be great to have those in a single material. I do think it can be done with gating, um, at least in, um, in ABC trilayer graphene, because that does show both um, behaviors in one sample. Uh, I think the challenge there is that you may have to do very carefully spatially aligned gates, because not only do you need to change the displacement field from one side to the other, but you also need to get a uh, particular filling on each side, and it's not the same filling. So um, it may be necessary to have uh, gates that with some cleverness or just brute force lithography are very well spatially aligned with each other. And I think that it's going to be the same story in um, twisted bilayer graphene. There we could imagine, and I, I've imagined using uh, a thin layer of boron nitride aligned with part of the graphene, but, um, but the rest of the graphene is not aligned with boron nitride then we could get magnetism on one side, superconductivity on the other. We still need to tune the densities. And I think a, a final opportunity, um, though I think the jury is still out on superconductivity, uh, would be in twisted monolayer bilayer graphene, which has been shown also now to, uh, to show this kind of magnetic switch. 
Well, that's great. Uh, thank, thank you so much uh, for giving the talk today um, and uh, appreciate your uh, doing that. Thanks very much. Well, I wish everyone um, serenity um, <laughs> and, um, and um, uh, I, uh, I went out and fixed my irrigation system in the garden today. Uh, and so uh, the feeling of being able to make a difference in something. Um, <laughs> Okay. Anyway, um, so um, so take care, and anyone who who wants to reach out, um, please don't hesitate to do that. I'm happy to get into conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.